Welcome to Simply by Grace, a podcast of Grace Life Ministries with founder and director, Dr. Charlie Bing. This podcast and other helpful resources can be found at our website, gracelife.org. Now, here's Dr. Bing. Well, we're here again, and we're going to share another Grace story with you in our series called Grace Stories. I hope you've been listening to some and, and sharing those with others, but if not, this is a good one to share. I'm talking to, actually, my pastor. His name's Gary Armstrong. And uh, we'll let you, he'll, we'll let him tell a little bit about his background. Uh, he's married to Chayla and has three boys and lives here in Burleson, pastoring Burleson Bible Church. So uh, anyway, welcome, Gary. And tell us where you were before you came to Burleson in ministry. Thank you, Charlie. Good to, to be on with you today. Uh, prior to answering the call to come to Burleson Bible Church, I was serving as the associate pastor at New Braunfels Bible Church in New Braunfels, Texas, serving alongside uh, Phil Congdon. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's a real blessing there, about five years there. Uh, prior to that, I was a senior pastor at South County Bible Church in St. Louis, Missouri. And so we were there about nine years and just various other, a uh, couple other ministry positions prior to that, uh, a little bit in California and uh, a little bit in uh, the Atlanta area as well, some church planting and various things like that. So. With all that ministry experience, people might be tempted to think you were born of immaculate conception. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> if they just meet me, you know, we will uh, <laughs> eliminate all those uh, spill, suspicions spill that, huh? right away. <laughs> now, sometimes people think that about pastors, you know, they think they're squeaky clean. Oh, yeah. And they can't imagine um, that they have a past. Uh, yeah. I have a past. You have a past. I think we all have a past. But uh, so let's let's talk yes. a little bit about where were you where were you originally from? I'm originally from Indianapolis, Indiana. So born and raised there. Mm-hmm. And um, you so you, you went to public school? Um, not until sixth grade. I was raised by Christian parents. Uh, you know, they were fundamental Baptist, and so we grew up in the fundamental Baptist church, the G-A-R-B-C, and so, uh, but I had a really good upbringing and uh, raised in church. We were, we lived at the church, Sunday morning, Sunday school, Sunday night, Wednesday night, grew up in Awana, uh, and went to Christian school as well through the church, so private uh, Christian education up until our family moved uh, when I was around 11-ish years old, and that's when I was first started going to public school. Okay. Where did you go to school before? Christian school? Yep, church Christian school, school Eagle Little Baptist Church and School in uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you had a lot of background in the in the Bible from church, but mm-hmm. Awana makes you memorize a lot of verses. And so yes. Forth, so. Yes. You had all that guidance, and mm-hmm. the scriptures tell us that if you raise up a child in the way you should go, he will not depart from it. Yes. Did you ever depart from that way? Um, I did. I certainly did. And uh, But I'm thankful for the foundation that was laid for me, and it played a, a major role in my life later. But yeah, definitely parted from that, became a prodigal, uh, starting in my early teen years. Started to really wander from fellowship with God. Well, how, how exactly did it happen? Did you have like people in the church that were your compadres in mischief, or did you go outside the church group of friends? Yeah, well, no, it it, it was uh, connections made in youth group is was the uh, <laughs> was the uh, means, I guess, to to lead me down that path, so to speak. But you know, I, there was a lot of factors involved in my my wandering. The world, the flesh, and the devil, as they say. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, there were there were some kids in youth group um, in the back row. It's where we sat, the back row, you know. And that's where mm-hmm. I was invited to my first rock concert, you know. And uh, but at the time, we had just uh, moved back to Indiana. We spent a year in Illinois, but starting a new church, new community, new school, and so you know. Like a lot of teenagers, you just want to be accepted into some sort of circle of friends. I didn't know a lot of folks. So, you know, and I was starting to um, have a little bit of a rebellious streak, I guess you could say. I had an older brother that influenced me uh, with drugs a little bit starting around age 13. And so all these things were 
uh, at play in my heart and life at the time. Um, and I didn't really understand what it, what it meant to, uh, to really walk in fellowship with God at that age. I knew Jesus. I became a believer around 10 years old at summer camp. But um, something else that happened shortly after my salvation was when we moved to that new location in, in, in Illinois, I also became the um, victim of a, of a predator in our neighborhood. And so I was sexually abused. At what age? Um, I was about 11 years old. Oh, my goodness. When that began. And that went on for the next few years. Oh, my goodness. And so, you know, as a, as a young believer, when you have things like that that happen to you in your life, you don't know how to process that. Um, so you did not speak of that to anyone? Never told anyone, not threats, until threats later. Threats made on you by this f predator? Nope, nope, never any of that. Just the shame or something? I mean, yeah, a lot of guilt and shame and, and just uncertainty. You know, you're not mentally, emotionally, spiritually even developed, I think, at that age to understand. Yeah. What do you do with something like that? And yeah. How do you process that? And So, yeah, all of that was at play. And so when you add that to... Now we've moved again, and we're back to a new location. And, and but you have this history of this trauma for the last couple of years, and and so man, just a you know. Yeah, and those years, the early teen years, are are difficult years for anybody. Right. Uh, you're trying to figure out who you are, and mm -hmm. you're being moved around to a whole new crowd, and so forth. So yeah, it it was tough, a tough <clears throat> transition. And you went back to the original church you had grown up in? Well, um, no, we had moved back to a suburb of Indianapolis, to a place called Brownsburg, Indiana. And so um, it was a similar church, though, same uh, denomination. What was the environment in the church like? Was it um, kind of the, some of these fundamental churches, I know they're, they're great churches, great people, mm -hmm. but some of them might emphasize external things it works how you dress right um how you behave what kind of music you listen to oh yeah Were you feel like you were judged in those areas well looking back absolutely and, and that was the type of, of church churches that we attended were the fundamental uh, conservative baptist so yeah the christian life was about what you looked like what you did or didn't do and so we were uh, told you know growing up that there was certain music that you didn't listen to your hair couldn't be a certain length it had to be off the collar and uh, you know and off the ears and off the ears it was yeah. really about appearance and yeah off the ears too yeah I for mean. my bible college off the yeah, ears. yeah yeah so um so that i think i learned kind of learned that yeah as a kid you know that if you do the right things and look the part you know then you're you're doing the the christian life the right way Mm -hmm. and so more of that after we moved back, similar church. I don't know that it was emphasized a lot, but looking back, I can see how that was a priority for a lot of folks that mm -hmm. went because you know, they dressed to the nines at church, and it was all about formality and things like that. But still good people, I'm sure. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. Great people, well-meaning, uh, and still have a lot of friendships. I still am, am friends with my youth pastor from back then who really did minister to me through that time. But. Okay, well, um, raised in a good church with a strong Bible background, walk us down your prodigal path. The prodigal path. Um, yeah, yes. you, the, the sexual abuse surely must have confused you quite a bit, but mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know how that might have played in. But um, how did that resolve, by the way? I, I got old enough, you know, uh, it went on for a few years, more infrequently, um, but when you get to be the age of you know 13 and uh you start to realize okay this is this is totally not right and i can do something about it and found my voice and just mm -hmm. put an end to it and uh and i think i kind of made my own threats you know okay. <laughs> to to keep that person away so i'm thankful for that and then was out from under that part of my life yeah it's always tragic to hear that uh, people have to go through that when they're innocent, unsuspecting, yeah, it, and naive about things like that. And these these predators just uh, they they get my goat. But anyway, <laughs> let's not dwell on that. Uh, yes. So where where did life take you in your teenage years? So yeah, just you know, my church experience, youth group experience. Um, what I always say that I didn't understand was. Um, 
I was never really discipled, and I didn't understand the importance of of uh, nurturing my fellowship with God. I didn't read the Bible really, didn't pray much as a teenager. I just didn't see a need. I thought, you know, I have a church and I have youth group and community of sorts and. You know, I'm just a Christian. It's just the life that I'm living because I was raised to live it this way. And again, the emphasis was always on as long as you're there, as long as you look the part, as long as you're, you know. And as long as you got your ticket to heaven. Oh, yeah. That's fire the important thing. So you, in place. you often hear the gospel preached every week, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it doesn't go much deeper than that. Yeah, yeah. It was a big part of my life that was missing. So when the challenges started to come, the temptations... Uh, actually, I kind of look at it as the spiritual attack on on me and my life because I, I believe at um, shortly after my salvation, uh, the following year of camp, I believe God called me to ministry. Mm. I felt a real sense of uh, God telling me that He wanted to use me in my life in full-time ministry. I, as a young age, yeah, but, and I didn't re know at the time what all that entailed, but I remember telling my mom what had happened, and I was truly convicted and convinced of it, and it's never left me. Mm -hmm. So shortly after that, that was when we moved, when all of the uh, abuse happened, and moving back then, and the other influences, and, and so I really see a lot of that as spiritual warfare that Satan wanted to use uh, sinful people and circumstances in my life to cause me to veer from that, from God's God's purpose for my life in that way. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so... What form of veering did that take in your life? What form was the veering? I, th I think it was uh, a hardened heart that got increasingly hardened towards God and things of God. You start to question why things happened to you and you know, uh, where was God? And, and then, you know, not really pursuing God or, or the things of God, wanting to live uh, the Christian life. And then the influence of the, the world that's even in the church and the worldly teenagers mm. that they seem to be having fun and they seem to be, you know, uh, enjoying life and doing the things that teenagers do. And so I just, I, it, it appealed to me. And a lot of it with the drugs that I started to experiment with in alcohol, um, looking back, I can see that that was an escape. It was I was masking a lot of hurt and pain and, and misunderstanding that I had in my life. I didn't know how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know how to run to God with it because I was never really discipled and understood who God is and how He could help me with these things. Mm -hmm. So so you self-medicated. Absolutely. In a sense. So Absolutely. many people just feel more comfortable, high, self-medicated than dealing with life's issues. Exactly. Yep. I did that. Painful difficulties. And the more that you do that early on, it becomes a, a habit in your life and you start pursuing that because you, you long for that release and, you know, to get your mind off of things that so was it you. was it was drinking and drugs? Was it a party scene too or uh, what went along with that? Yeah. Yeah. Just, you know, hanging out at, at uh, school, you know, with the the friends that I hung out with, you know, and we're always talking about where the next party is and just yeah, chasing everything, just chasing the acceptance from that peer group, but then, you know, the um, the release through the drugs and alcohol, women, you know, chasing girls and just being promiscuous through my teen years as well. All of it, I think, was trying to fill this emptiness that I had that I didn't know why it was there necessarily or what to do with it yeah so the the drugs i've heard part of your story before got you into trouble absolutely yeah. um you, you want to jump to that or you got something yeah okay. no let's, let's i mean because that was i needed that i needed to get in trouble i got in trouble for everything i did <laughs> anyway as a kid <laughs> my friends always seemed to get away with things but i always seemed to get in trouble but thankfully when i was 19 I uh, got arrested for possession and dealing of, of drugs, uh, LSD and marijuana, two different counties. And, and what had happened was a man that used to sell me and some of my friends drugs got arrested. And so to help himself out, they wired him up and sent him out to go, you know, get us um, guys, you know, trying to get a bigger dog, I guess. And 
So I was uh, set up by this informant. Uh, but, you know, God used that. And it's I needed that. I was still using drugs and still you know, pursuing that life and not really concerned about God or His will for my life. And so that was a major wake-up call when DEA officers show up to your place of business at 19 years old and say, you're under arrest. And they take you away. Mm. And at the time, it was four felonies. Mm. And um, I think in all, I was uh, facing about 29 years, if, if I or given the maximum security, because these were felonies. They don't mess around with dealing in Schedule One, which is what they called it, LSD. Mm-hmm. Times have changed, you know, and, and certain drugs yeah, you today. Go to, you can, some states you can go get some for free. Right, right. The police is, will give it to you. Yeah, maybe. right. <laughs> they aren't as concerned about marijuana today. Yeah. And it's still illegal, but it was a different time. It was early 90s, and so it was a big deal. It was, it was scary. I was angry. Uh, I was cursing out the DEA agents. Why you guys, you know, you guys set me up and, you know, they didn't say anything. But uh, that's what I needed. I got locked up in Hendricks County Jail as I sat there in the holding cell uh, contemplating what had just happened to me. And it took a few days because my mind was still just foggy with Hmm. drugs that I'd done. You know, when you're in this drug and drug mindset i guess that lifestyle you're Mm -hmm. not thinking clearly you're not evaluating your life you're just thinking about the next good time or whatever and you think i thought i was enjoying life i had my own job i had an apartment with a roommate i was you know partying uh even had a fake id charlie at 19 years old man so i was i was big time and uh god put it all to a halt thankfully because i i was living a dangerous life i could have very easily died from some of the things I w- was doing. Yeah. Uh, By God's grace, I think a lot of people who <laughs> look back at their teenage years like me and say, mm. they're, you know, but for the grace of God. But Whole so lot of grace. did you bail out of, uh, of jail and then face a courtroom trial? I, I did not bail out of jail because my folks um, were wise enough to not bail me out of jail. Um, Thankfully, they let me rot in jail. No. Uh, (laughs) Had I been bailed out, I would not have learned what I learned. But they said, hey, you know, you're going to kind of have to work this one out. And so I got a public defender. I just sat there and I just waited for uh, my court date. And so I sat in jail for probably six months before I was actually convicted. Wow. But I was... Uh, convicted of, of a felony, and any time you're convicted of a felony in the state of Indiana, at least, at the time at least, you had to go to prison. And so um, I thought at, at 19, uh, I turned 20 around that same time, that I'd maybe do the rest of my sentence, which they gave me a six-year sentence. They suspended four years. I got a two-year sentence. Mm-hmm. You get good time, you get a a day for every day, uh, good day. So two for one. So mm-hmm. I only had to do a year. I already had half of it done. So I'm thinking I'm going to go to some, you know, uh, Boy Scout camp prison, you know, because, yeah. you know, I got a little bit of time. I'm a young guy. I didn't have a previous record. But what I didn't know was that when you have a pending charge and you're convicted uh, of a felony, you get sent to a maximum security prison. Didn't know that at the time. Hmm. I was still waiting to be arraigned on the other charges that all kind of came at the same time, but they were two different counties. So I learned uh, when they woke us up uh, in the middle of the night to take us off to uh, the prison that they were going to send us to. They said, Armstrong, you're going to Westville Correctional Center. And I had already heard stories about Westville. Hmm. It was a level four maximum security prison. And I was sc- shocked. I was scared. Level four, that's like the that, the worst of the that's, criminals? That's the highest. That's the highest. Uh, aside or, or from the maybe lowest. Supermax. <laughs> yeah. So, wow. Man, Charlie. Um, they sent me to a maximum security prison. Here I am, 20 years old, hmm. loaded up in a van with other prisoners, 
driving us out of this maximum security prison. And I remember stepping off that van in shackles, hands and feet shackled in a white jumpsuit, passing by uh, the yard where all the prisoners were out in the wreck time and seeing guys run up to the fence, catcalling all of us new hmm. prisoners coming in, the fresh meat, you know, and just remember thinking, wow, uh, this could be a really scary time. Yeah, right. you must have been scared. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, I was scared. You know, you try not to show it, you gotta look tough, but hmm. uh, there, it was, there was a very real danger there. Uh, so much so that um, when I first got on to the prison dorm, they put you on a, a administration and orientation dorm. It's for all the incoming uh, prisoners, and they kind of acclimate you, give you your your clothes, and and they kind of then tell you what to expect. But um, there was a man, uh, an African American prisoner who was also on that dorm. The other half of that dorm was the honor dorm. It's where the good prisoners got to go because they behaved themselves for long enough. The other half was administration orientation. This guy saw me and for no other reason other than God moved this man to have compassion on me. He approached me and said, hey, you don't need to be here because I'm, I'm a young looking person anyway. I was 20 years old, blonde haired, blue eyed, you know, skinny, mm -hmm. you know, guy walking into this maximum security prison. He knew right away this kid's going to be in trouble. And this man, who had already been in prison for, I think, 17 years at the time, was essentially an attorney. He had studied wow. law, he knew the laws, he knew how to file paperwork. And this man looked out for me and he filed paperwork to try and get me moved uh, to, you know, out of the prison, which you mm -hmm. know, I never eventually got, but he arranged for me to get sent to a, a dorm where he knew people that would look out for me and kind of protect me because the, the dangers were legitimate. There were guys my age, my size that got abused, they got um, mm -hmm. beat up, they got raped. And there's no reason that that shouldn't have happened to me. Yeah. God protected you through God that. God protected me. Yeah, even in prison. Draw us into the, the world. Not, not many of us have seen the inside of the prison. Um, mm -hmm. Been close, but not, not seen it. And what are, you, what are you thinking? You're sitting there. Draw us into your world a little bit about what you, what do you think about all day? What do you what do? You do? do, you, do you read well, books, watch TV, <laughs> work out? I mean, or is it, do you have that much freedom? Oh, yeah, yeah, there's not much that's structured. So, um, just to back up, so the county jail was most of my experience, thankfully, and so that was a lot more confined and limited in what you could do there. But um, just a, a few weeks after I was in the county jail, I had a real come to Jesus time in my life hmm. where. Um, I just opened up the Bible on my bunk, and it just I just opened to the Psalms. I hadn't read the Bible in years. And just reading the Psalms, God just broke me. And He just reminded me of His amazing love for me, of His purpose for my life. And I remember feeling as if I had just been uh, slapping God in the face with my life, mm -hmm. the life that He redeemed, that He called you know, to, to use. And I've just, just trashed it, you know, like mm. the prodigal son, mm -hmm. you know. And so, um, so I, I got really close to the Lord while I was uh, incarcerated. I think early on, early on, yeah, first few weeks. And, uh, and so that, that was, uh, a wonderful opportunity that God gave me to wake me up. Uh, to the realization of how I was wasting my life, but we spent most of the days, you know, uh, yeah, reading and, and doing some Bible study and stuff like that. But you just get to hang out with the guys. We played a lot of poker. Man, I am <laughs> I am good at poker today. Oh, yeah. Played a lot of spades, uh, watching TV, you know, um, singing, you know, different things. You what's, make friendships in there, too. Yeah. What's the spiritual environment? Do they chaplains visit, uh, prison ministries visit, uh, 
Bible studies going on? They do, at least in my experience. So that was a huge part of my experience uh, was the ministry of the Gideons. They came hmm. in to our cell block weekly, and these two Gideons in particular, you know, I connected with, and they prayed with me, and they gave hmm. me stuff to read, and they just really ministered to me through that time. But then there's also a chapel on Sundays, and so I was a part of the chapel service um, every Sunday, and God, and we worked out, uh, you know, I, I got in some pretty good shape, you know, and uh, so there's always things to do to, to occupy yourself, and you have to, or you'll mm -hmm. go crazy in there. Would, would you say that your experience behind bars after those first few weeks was a walk with the Lord? I, I would say I, I walked with God as, as much as I understood it and could, and so... Yeah, I, actually, Charlie, I felt, I remember talking to my mom once um, over the phone and saying, Mom, I have never felt more um, freedom in mm. my life mm. than I did being behind bars. That's amazing, yeah. Because God had so um, released me from the guilt of my past sins, the forgiveness that He showed me, the grace, right? So mm -hmm. I was so excited now about, <laughs> man, I still have an opportunity to, to get out of here and, and make a change and actually live out what I, what I knew God's will was for my life. He got me early enough in my life. I didn't just spend decades of just wandering and squandering, you know. Reminds me of Paul's experience in the, uh, that he reflects in the letter to the Philippians, how in jail he's telling them to rejoice and he, he's rejoicing. Right. So that was that was what God did in my life, and it was exciting. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, it was a very spiritual experience. Yeah. So how, how did that end up? How did you end up just serve your term out? I did. I, I spent, uh, it was only a few, you know, three, four months left by the time I got to prison. But, uh, you know, as my release date was approaching, um, the Bible stopped being read as much, you know, I started to think more about just getting out and freedom again. You know, a year is a long time <laughs> yeah. uh, to spend yeah. <laughs> locked up. Well, some of us were locked up with COVID. We, that's nothing like prison, <laughs> but I mean, it's a long time to be isolated. Yeah, that's, that's a good uh, Socially way to isolated. relate to it because th that's similar. And so, um, but what I didn't have, I did get released. My mom picked me up. But... I didn't have um, a real foundation to, to come back to. I didn't have a, a network. I didn't have a church. I didn't have Christian friends. All my friends were just the people that I'd known prior to going in that just partied and, you know, they weren't believers walking with God. So when I got out, uh, I was scared straight for a while. I was on house arrest, so I couldn't do certain things for a while. I was on probation for four years. I had to go to NA meetings for four years. Mm. And so I was trying to um, play it safe uh, for a while. But eventually, uh, I started to dabble back into some of the same things that I did prior to that. Mm -hmm. um, just because I think I just didn't know where to go. I didn't know. Yeah. Well, I have, uh, in my experience, friends that went through drug rehab programs and they, they spit them out spit them out back in the old neighborhood yep. and uh, people like me that weren't walking with the Lord at the time just, you know, tempted them and back into the old lifestyle. Yeah. Um, yes. So, yeah, I know that how was that my goes. story. And that's, that's a shame that they don't have a good follow-up. The great thing about uh, what happened to me after I was released is that I met my wife. Yeah, I was wondering when she'd get into the picture here. Yeah, I had, you know, when I, I went back to visit uh, a friend that I knew prior to going in there and my wife was there and uh, with another boyfriend. Hey, so I mean, <laughs> just kind of stole her from him, but. Um, We're gonna hope to hear her side of the story someday, <laughs> so you better be accurate about this. Oh, thing. that's right, yeah, I better watch what I say. I was smitten, Charlie, she was beautiful, our eyes met, and, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, my wife, um, we just started to date a couple weeks after that, and you should hear my wife's story. She has an incredible testimony, but she was a teenage mother when I met her, 
Zachary was 10 months old. But we both were just, you know, uh, this young couple that just were naive and immature and, mm. and a lot of baggage. She has a lot of baggage. I, I'm coming into this relationship with all kinds of baggage. Mm -hmm. So I'm fresh out of prison. So we know where her standards were, I guess. But uh, <laughs> did, it, did it take very long to get married? No, we, we met, uh, or excuse me, we started dating June 22nd of 1993, and we were married July 9th, 1994. So uh, we were just met, started dating, and married within like a year. Yeah. So it, it happened pretty quick. But yeah. we will be married 29 years this July 9th. Hey, congratulations. So, yeah, That's God good. is good. Yeah. And so your marriage has just been a model marriage from day one. Yes. We've never argued. Yeah. We've gotten along never perfectly. Lied. Yeah, it's been, it's like heaven. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, don't get me on that because, uh, I mean, I don't know how long this podcast is. <laughs> well, we'll do a marriage podcast yeah. some other time, but it, things didn't go well, huh? Yeah, you know, so my wife did not know the Lord. Uh, hmm. And so at the time we met, you know, I was, you know, scared straight and trying to do the right thing. And, and she was a good girl. You know, she, she also was a disciplined young lady. She still graduated high school on time, though she had a child. I mean, so, uh, but we brought all our baggage together and uh, we just, you know, had that same circle of friends, the type of friends that we all kind of hung out with. And so when you bring two uh, young people together with all the baggage and all the struggles and you know, we didn't know, and Jesus was not a part of her life. And at the time, you know, I kind of left Jesus in prison, so mm. to speak. Um, and so we were just, yeah, we were a mess. We actually split up within two months of being married. We wow. split up. We were going to just get divorced, and it was mostly me. I got married at, um, in part because I thought, man, I need this. I need to settle down. I need to get serious about life. And I love this girl, but you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that marriage is going to make make it grow up. And mm -hmm. I, I was not uh, grown up enough. And so um, we split up. But um, we we got back together just a few months later. And that was a God thing as well, how that played out in our, mm -hmm. in our relationship. But we got back together um, and um, we started to try to go to church. My wife went to church with my mom one Sunday, met a church planting pastor in Indianapolis that was starting a church near the place where we were living. Long story short, this pastor and my wife exchanged information because, um, and she's unsaved, mm -hmm. because he said, hey, you know, maybe I can connect with you guys and blah, 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 and meet your husband. And so when she came back home um, after that Sunday, she told me, hey, this pastor, Tom Grafe, is going to be reaching out to you. And I knew right then, okay, this is going to be a God-ordained uh, appointment for me. Mm -hmm. I kind of knew. I was, I was already sick and tired of struggling. I'm back in the struggle again. Mm -hmm. I'm down on life. You know, I've been in prison. I, you know, no one wants to hire a felon, <laughs> you know, uh, my license was suspended. I didn't have money. You know, I had a girl and we had a relationship, but the rest of my life was still a mess and not getting any better. So I knew God was, was working. And so that pastor eventually did call me a couple days later. And when the phone rang, Charlie, I knew as soon as the phone rang, hmm. I got, I, I got chills. I got goosebumps. Wow. I'm, you know, it's not something typical for me, but I knew right then I know who this is and I know why he's calling. And sure enough, we had this conversation. He invited me over to his house that night. And this is where the grace of God just mm -hmm. came running in. Because that was the night I was 21 years old at this point. Sick and tired of being sick and tired. Sick and tired of no joy, no peace, no mm -hmm. direction, no purpose. Mm -hmm. I, I'm married to this woman and, and I'm not doing a good job at that. I am a terrible husband. I'm no kind of father to this young boy that I, you know, I just now became an instant father to. And I knew, I knew I was failing at all these things. And I didn't know how, uh, I didn't know, I just didn't know how mm -hmm. to change or how to be different or the path to take. Because I just had never been discipled, I never mm -hmm. knew next steps. So that pastor that night, 
showed me. He opened up the Bible and showed me why I lacked peace, why I lacked joy, why I was still struggling. And I understood that night that I'm, I'm still wandering. I'm still living in sin. I'm still not seeking Jesus in my life. I'm still dabbling in the world and trying to fill voids with uh, the world's means. And, and that's the night that I got on my hands and knees mm. and I prayed and I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I knew Jesus. He was my Savior. But I never really surrendered uh, to his, his will, his plan, you know, for like my life. Romans 12, 1 and 2 type of surrender, offer your body a living sacrifice. Absolutely. I'll just pause there for a second because uh, there are some people who say, well, you, you weren't saved until that moment. Mm -hmm. You weren't saved until you got down on your knees and surrendered your life. Right. But what would you say to people say that, that view called Lordship Salvation? Yeah, I just, I just, it's just not true. I, I knew Jesus. Um, I understood the gospel. I believed in Jesus. Never once, even through all those product years, did I ever doubt my eternal security because I just understood that salvation is a free gift. Mm -hmm. When you receive Jesus, you have everlasting life. And I never doubted that, thankfully. Um, but for me, you know, um, Jesus, uh, he wants to rule my life. But obviously, as a believer, I also have a will. I lived out my will all those years. I did what I thought was best, what I wanted to do. I thought fun and excitement and joy and happiness came through these other means, you know, partying. And I mean, the thought of going to church, even as a Christian teenager in, in my early adulthood, I thought going to church, <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, check fun at the door. You could do that. But I just didn't see how that life would be fun, exciting, you know, at all. Mm -hmm. And so it was a lie. I was believing a lie. Mm -hmm. uh, boy, was I wrong. So, you know. So this was a real turning point in your life. It stuck. Absolutely. Uh, after talking to this pastor that night. Now I'm just waiting to hear how Shayla got. I really want to get her story too. Mm -hmm. So we'll hear her full story. But yeah. when did she uh, get saved? Four days later. Four days later. Yeah. How did I, that happen? You talked It's because to I was so perfect after that. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> and sinless. No. Um, <laughs> right. It is cool because I was at that pastor's house till like three in the morning. Mm. <laughs> and I came home to my wife, a different person. Hmm. I, the load of guilt from my previous hmm. years of wandering and sin, hmm. you know, uh, of the struggle, were just lifted. I just gave them to the Lord, and mm -hmm. He forgave me. He cleaned my slate, you know, hmm. and I had fellowship with God once again. And it's like all the things that you learn as a kid and all the kind of come flooding back and it's just like boy I just God just lit my heart on fire and I was so excited and she's looks at me did she forgive you for waking her up at three o'clock in the morning <laughs> I, she's probably waiting up for me she was that was the that was the pattern waiting up for me to come home but uh she looked at me and saw something changed in her husband she didn't know this person I had witnessed to her prior to that, but it was mm. from a, a sinful lifestyle, you know, mm -hmm. uh, just, you know, as I'm smoking cigarettes and, you know, trying to share with her the gospel, you know, she's like, so, you know, you can just, you can believe in Jesus, you know, and he'll forgive you and you'll be in heaven, but, you know, um, it's a gift. And I'm like, yeah, you know, it just wasn't believable, mm -hmm. you know, for her at the time, I think because... I wasn't necessarily living mm -hmm. the way that she had grown up thinking that Christians lived. You might say cog cognitive dissonance between Very what much. she saw and what you were saying. Yeah, there was. There was a disconnect. Big term. I've never used it before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You should look into that. <laughs> but thankfully, God just transformed me. And uh, I was excited and changed. And she saw such a difference in me. She walked down to a payphone. Remember payphones, Charlie? Yeah, I think I do. She walked down to a payphone and called. I remember when they were a dime. Well, okay. You don't you, remember you that. You got me on that. Yeah. No, it was a quarter. Quarter. Here's a quarter. Call someone who cares. <laughs> and she did. She called that pastor and she said, hey, all right. And this is the way she says it. I know I've got the man of my dreams all of a sudden, but I also realize I'm missing something. What's happened hmm. that I'm missing? Hmm. And he said, why don't you come over and talk to my wife and I tonight? She went over 
talked with him and his wife, she opened up the Bible. They showed her Ephesians 2, 8, 9, because she always thought that she had to, it had to be by works or living a good life or even, even mm -hmm. speaking in tongues was her background. Hmm. And never really got it and understood it. So that night, she understood the gospel and she put her faith in Jesus Christ mm. and became a believer. It's just a beautiful thing. I wish so, evangelism was that easy for all pastors. I know, <laughs> they right? Come, can I come over and talk about how to get saved? That's great. We were ripe fruit, and, and she was the first convert in that church plant Wow! back in 1995. Mm -hmm. And so exciting, just exciting stuff. And that's when God really started to... Uh, get a hold of our lives as, as I'm now living a surrendered life, saying, okay, Lord, I remember just saying, Lord, what, whatever, whatever you have for me, hmm. you know, I want that. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what all that would involve, but I was ready for whatever. So all your marriage problems were solved at this point? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Man, <laughs> my marriage was, it was still just a real struggle. Again, just because you come to know Jesus, you know, or even surrender your life to the Lord, you still got all the baggage. You still got your history. You still got think, learned behaviors, yep. temptations. You know, now now we're novices and we're just starting. And now we have ch a child, and then we had another child, and so yeah, it was. But the thing is, is, when you you struggle in marriage as a Christian, at least you have a resource. Yes, you have a power that's greater than you that you can go to for help, and and God can enable that kind of help. But there's so many marriages that don't have that kind of hope. Yes, and they turn to maybe secular counselors or something that only feed their their problems sometimes. But so at least you yeah. have all Christians always have hope in a marriage. But, Absolutely. So anyway, your marriage did improve to a point where now she's she's friendly towards you. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> no, she's. You guys have looks like from the outside of a good relationship. So that's great. I'm well, sure you still have your problems like all of us do. But we do. Yeah, we, we still have some struggles. We still uh, need the Lord's help every day. We're still growing. Well, let's talk about your, your ministry path. So uh, did, did you jump immediately into, you said you were called back mm -hmm. when you were young. And now that's probably a memory coming back to you. Mm -hmm. and, yes. And what, what kind of steps did you take towards ministry? So we got involved in that church plant, and we're growing, and Shayla's uh, starting to teach twos and threes, you know, Bible stories that she had never learned, you know. So it was exciting times. We were working with youth. But, yeah, that, that calling, God started to remind me of. But I was hesitant, and I thought, surely God doesn't still want to use me as a pastor because look at my life. I just lived the last seven, eight years of my life and wanton pleasure, as they say, you know, prodigal son. Mm -hmm. And I thought, there's no way, you know. And then my wife, she was a teen mom. She just came to know the Lord. So when we started talking about it, she's apprehensive. I'm apprehensive. But what we did is we prayed about it. About we, going into full-time ministry. Uh-huh. And I, I kept saying, Lord, you know, I don't know if this is, if this is really what you have for me, but I want to pray about it. And I sought counsel. I talked to my pastor talked to uh, another missionary friend and just said, hey, here's our story. Look at all that you know we've been through and what we've done. And do you think that maybe God would still call, call me into the pastorate, the ministry, you know? And every answer we got was absolutely. That's, hmm. that's what God's in the business of doing is transforming lives mm -hmm. and using people. And so um, what I did to test the waters was I enrolled in a, Bible course at Indianapolis School of the Bible. Uh, it was called Baptist Bible College of Indianapolis, I think, at the time. Mm -hmm. And I took Old Testament survey, <laughs> just an introductory class. Mm. And boy, did God use that in my life, studying Genesis and just, you know, uh, different Old Testament books. And I remember the first Bible class I took after living a prodigal life was uh, Old Testament also. And I yeah. just say. Is there that much in the Bible? Right. <laughs> I was expecting a Sunday school class, and boy, it was so deep. Oh. It was, it's amazing how much is there. So you, when those teachers start teaching, yeah. so yeah. so that whetted your appetite, and absolutely, you, you just wanted to get more and more. Yeah, I got excited, and I thought, wow, this is so, this is great, and so God used it to really solidify that. Yes, He He still. You know, I remember Romans eleven twenty nine. I take a verse out of context, but I remember that 
verse sticking with me. The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Well, that's a general principle. It's not really out of, I mean, it's talking yeah. about the Jewish God dealing with the Jews, but it's a general principle that's true for everybody. Well, it was true for me because I remember reading that going, just because I run from a call doesn't mean that God hasn't still called and that he doesn't still want to use me. And then the life of Jonah, you know, oh man, just thinking of uh, studying and reading Jonah. Jonah 4, 1 says, and the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, after he said, ah, I think I'll go the other way. That's mm -hmm. what I did. I just so related to that. And those, God used those things in that journey to remind me he's a God of grace. He's a God of compassion and forgiveness, and restoration. And so all along, I just kept following what I felt God was leading me to do in my life. And so we were only in that church plant for maybe a year. And we had the Word of Life local church ministries, Word of Life program for our teens. Mm -hmm. And Shayla and I were involved in that as youth leaders, and we loved it. And so I, I learned, oh, Word of Life has a Bible Institute. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's cool. And so... After I had enrolled in that class at the local college, I said, being married with now two kids at the time, I thought married people with kids don't go to Bible college. You missed it. You know, you missed the boat. <laughs> Doesn't make it easier, but <laughs> no. You can and do so it. I remember asking a staff person at that Bible college, and I was like, you don't, you don't ever have married people that come to college there. And they're like, oh, yeah, we got married student housing. And I mean, it blew my mind. I thought, what? And so I got even more excited. And Boy, that was another one. So we said, I think this is what God wants. So we we raised prayer support from our local church. We had people financially help us uh, so that we could just pick up, move to upstate New York. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did. Yeah, I love Word of Life Ministries. Great ministry. It's I, fantastic. Like I just came back from the Philippines working with them. And so, yeah, they're, I, lo I love their heart for evangelism, especially. Mm -hmm. But the Bible schools do influence a lot of people. That was my experience. Got to, got to uh, learn uh, from Charles Ryrie in person. Mm -hmm. and Ken Ham came and mm. spoke and, and a lot of seminary presidents. And it was just a, an amazing time of growth and transformation for my wife and I. And then from there, you went in, into pastoring uh, yourself. Uh, were you on staff first or did you jump into a senior pastor position? I did. Well, I went on then to Appalachian Bible College in mm. West Virginia and... Upon graduation, um, I went to California. I said, Lord, where where are the most sinful, <laughs> unregenerate people in the yeah. world? Sorry, California. people in California who are I'm listening to this. Kidding. He's just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. No, but you know, honestly, um, I wanted to I wanted to reach people. You know, I, I wanted to. I didn't want to go. You know, where there's uh, mm -hmm. places saturated with churches. I don't want to be in the Bible Belt. I want to go, mm -hmm. Where where is a great need? And I knew from a book that I read that statistically, California did have a lot of need. There were oh, a lot yeah. of unreached places. So I went out as a church planter uh, to California, my wife, and now three small children. Mm -hmm. And so I was a church planting pastor for close to um, a year there until I um, assumed the role of senior pastor at a Bible church out there in Central California. So I did the church planting thing. It you know, it wasn't a lot of um, support there, not a lot of uh, organization. And then a church that I was working with, their pastor resigned. God worked it out and ended mm -hmm. up taking the senior pastor role there at Galt Bible Church. And then uh, you pastored in Missouri also? Correct. Yeah, and yep. then before you came to Texas here. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Well, we're real happy to have you at Burleson Bible Church. Um, uh, we are and, thrilled to yeah, be there. Things, things are going very well, and and I think everybody's tickled to have you there. But we, you, we've been mentioning grace throughout the conversation. How you know, grace protected, guided, mm -hmm. and so forth. Have you come to appreciate God's grace to a, in a deeper level? through your ministry and your past experiences and even mm. through your study of theology. Because yeah. that's what, you know, Grace Life is all about. We want mm -hmm. to help people understand grace, so. Well, my, my grace journey started in California because leaving Bible college, you have all your theology in place, you know. Yeah, right. You know what you were taught. You're more than your teachers, you know. Um, I uh, was a big Johnny Mac fan early on, John MacArthur. 
and being in California was now closer. And so I even attended a couple um, shepherds conferences at MacArthur host and, and I enjoyed aspects of that. Mm-hmm. But I remember God putting a man in our church that challenged me on some things that I was preaching, particularly in Ephesians one about uh, the election of God and things like that. And, you know, I just kind of regurgitated what I was trained with in school and I didn't really understand certain uh, doctrines, Calvinistic doctrines, the mm-hmm. tulip. I didn't understand it. Mm-hmm. I thought maybe I did. But that man God used in my life to really push me uh, to investigate. And then I had another ministry partner who also was a hyper-Calvinist mm. and uh, lordship guy. And he was espousing the doctrines of grace uh, that's espoused from those right. ministries. and. And it became an issue in the church. Mm. And so now I had uh, a lot of motivation to figure out what I do believe. And, and so that began my journey of reading books on it from both perspectives. I, I talked with other pastors. I had some really good reform pastor friends out there. And I just sat down with one of them in particular and said, help me understand how you came to these conclusions mm-hmm. about your theology And I remember coming away from that, understanding more how they arrive at those doctrines. But I also understood, I don't agree with that. I don't see the same thing in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And so for the next, you know, 10 years, studying on my own, listening, reading different perspectives and just reading the Bible and praying and just the God that I see in the scriptures um, is the God of grace. He is the God of unmerited favor, unconditional love mm-hmm. and and it just built and solidified what i felt like i already believed through those years but it just became more and more grounded in my mm-hmm. heart and my life and my theology uh, so right. it's been an evolution of sorts um, but today i feel like i uh, appreciate his grace so much more especially understanding what we call free grace you know and and uh so it's, it's been a tremendous blessing to learn and to grow in grace and to understand it and to become a, a man of grace and more gracious and more understanding as God is with us. Yeah. Well, grace is like an unfathomable topic to, mm-hmm. that we can always try to attain to in, uh, in our experience. Um, mm-hmm. You know, as I think about your life and all that you've been through, I, I'm reminded of Luke chapter 22 where Jesus warned Peter uh, I'll just read the verse, uh, 2231. Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Mm. So I think what you've kind of said, started to say a little while ago, was that your experiences actually don't disqualify you as pastor, but give you more insight and depth so that you can understand people like, that's what Hebrews says about Jesus as our high priest because he was tempted like we are. Mm-hmm. Uh, he understands our weaknesses. And so I think it gives you a stronger edge in pastoring. Mm-hmm. Is that, am I correct about that? I, I, w- I would have to agree with that just in that um, I feel like that's, that's my mission is uh, God has um, forgiven me much. Um, he has restored me so that I can um, help other people understand just how far-reaching His grace is. That there is no sins that can't be forgiven. There's, there's, you can't get too far from God uh, you know, beyond His grace. Well, that's what I was going to close with and just ask you to, there's somebody listening out there who's feeling like they've really blown it morally or have gone through something like, like sexual abuse or prison mm-hmm. or... Uh, drug abuse or a broken marriage. Um, I mean, we could list all kinds of Mm -hmm. things. But they're thinking, can God use me? Is there any hope for me? Is there life after this mess? And just, can you Mm. just close your time by what you would say to them? Yeah, absolutely. Because I've I've been, uh, I've done all those things, you know. I've, I've experienced all those things in a very real way. And so from my experience, uh, I would just say, um, seek, seek God. Really pursue 
the God of the Bible and not maybe our concept of God or who we think God is based on maybe what we've learned in the past or the way we were raised or whatever. We really have to um, come to seek God and, and receive His grace and His forgiveness, His compassion, because it's readily available any time. And so there's always hope. There's always hope. And uh, I've experienced it at many different stages of my life, and I still experience it today. And I would say that's my mission. That's kind of my heart is for the prodigals, for the disenfranchised. I think there's a lot of people out there that do know Jesus. They have believed the gospel. They have understood, and they are born again. But like me, a lot of them weren't grounded. We weren't discipled. Maybe we had a bad experience. Maybe we've had trauma. And so, and Satan wants to sift us like we. My testimony early on was from 1 Peter 5, 8. The devil is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He wanted to consume me. He wanted to derail me because he knew that any person that understands and lives out God's grace um, is a danger to him. And, you know, they are, they are uh, just, they're a force for the gospel and for the work of God on the earth. So mm -hmm. that's what I'd say is, you know, uh, receive the grace of God. It's freely available. Nothing that we've ever done will ever keep us from His love. But we have to receive it. We have mm -hmm. to be open to it. We have to come to Him and receive it Amen. Uh, in order to experience it. Amen. Well, Gary, it's been a great uh conversation with you and to hear your story and thanks for being very open and uh, transparent about my pleasure about your life I, th I think people will relate to that and uh, we appreciate you appreciate your time today thank you Charlie I really appreciate the invite okay well we're gonna hear Shayla's story sometime in the future and see if Gary's uh, matches hers <laughs> <laughs> but anyway we're glad that you joined us today and uh, if you want to hear more about Gary uh, or you, his ministry we'll put your if you want to your information in the text at the Absolutely. beginning of the podcast so people can get in touch with you if they want to ask you something or contact you for any reason um, but you know some of the things Gary talked about like Calvinism Grace Life has a booklet on uh, Calvinism that helps people understand what they're buying into if they are so inclined and also we have books about lo the topic of Lordship Salvation our latest book is called uh, Let's Share the Good News Clearly and uh, we just put that out, and it's helping the people to understand the gospel of grace clearly. And uh, you can find us on Facebook, join our group, Grace Life Ministries, and uh, Instagram. It's simply by grace with underscore between the words. And uh, you'll, you'll find us. We'll have that kind of information always available. But thanks for listening. What you could really do to help this podcast and message get shared is to give us a rating, make a comment and share it with as many people as you can because I know that you know somebody that needs to hear what Gary said. They need to, they need not only to believe in Jesus Christ as Savior maybe, but maybe they've done that and they just need to come back to Him and uh, mm. surrender their life to Him and live for Him as Lord. So that's another great story and uh, we, we appreciate Gary and God's grace in his life and we would like to hear maybe sometime what God's doing in your life. So until all here. Thank you for listening. For more resources, or to help spread the message of God's life-changing grace, visit our website at gracelife.org. We'd love to hear from you. Send us a message at simplybygrace at gracelife.org. See you next time.